Today's edition of the DBR podcast is sponsored by the Bird Campbell Law Firm, founded by a pair of former Duke roommates, Jamie Campbell and Tucker Bird. Look them up online, birdcampbell.com. Hey there, Duke fans, and welcome to episode 89 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. We are coming to you on Monday, October 23rd, and it was a weekend of college basketball. Yes, Duke basketball is officially back. We're going to get into countdown of craziness. We will recap that. We will also dive into a little bit of football and a Duke commercial, a Duke basketball commercial, or is it a LeBron commercial? We're going to get into all that, but first, let me introduce myself. I am Donald Wine. Coming to you from Washington, D.C. on what is a magnificent Monday afternoon. Uh, my fellow partners in crime are here. First, I got Sam Klein in Denver, Colorado. Sam, how's the weather out there? Uh, everything is great out here in Denver, and I apologize because my audio is going to be crummy today. Uh, I had to call in from my cell phone. This is what happens when we come to you live during the workday. Sometimes adjustments yeah, must be made. Uh, and Sam's doing I work. A, I, I work at... I, I work an annoyingly uh, uh, legitimate job um, where I do have to be in the office most of the day. I need you to stop being legitimate, at least for today. All right. Well, I'll do my best. Okay. And in Atlanta, Georgia, we have Jason Evans. Jason, what's going on? Uh, so what's going on with me is when we record during the day, uh, daytime means squirrels. And you may think, what, what are you talking about? Well, my dog, Cameron, who, you know, folks who've listened to the podcast for many years, they know and love Cameron. He's always barking and stuff like that. Cameron can see the squirrels when we record during the day. And so I guarantee at some point during this podcast, he will bark and go crazy because there is a squirrel outside of my window. Um, there are always squirrels outside my window, but ordinarily when we record at night, Cameron can't see them and it doesn't matter. So I'm apologizing in advance. Sam, apologize for the audio. I'm apologizing for the squirrels. Well, maybe Cameron's going to be excited about how we talk about Marvin Bagley and the rest of the Blue Devils, because I think he was pretty exciting uh, uh, last Friday night. Oh, oh, for sure. Yeah. See, see, he not, approves. Not, you can hear him. Yes. Yeah, you could hear him. <laughs> and not just Marvin Bagley. Absolutely. Well, let's just get right into it. All right. So Friday night is the opening, the unofficial opening of college basketball season uh, for the Duke Blue Devils with the countdown to craziness. Uh introduction of players you have the glitch you have the glamour you have the dancing and then you have a little bit of a, a blue white scrimmage um and this is something that has been happening for a few years now uh these guys come out and this is their first introduction in full to the duke cameron crazy faithful uh i'm going to start with you uh jason you have to talk about the dancing because you're probably the uh, i don't know if you're the worst dancer i really haven't seen you dance yet um well, I'm, but, I'm the worst dancer i'm definitely okay, the worst well, dancer <laughs> so, self-appointed worst dancer jason evans we'll talk about the intros and and all the introductions of players and most importantly the dancing talk to us jason yeah so uh i, I was um i was not impressed with much of the dancing uh the only guy who i thought was really good was Gary Trent Jr. Um, he seemed really smooth. I thought he was probably the best dancer on the team. Um, uh, I, I thought that uh, the Besser, Brennan Besser, did a really nice job. He looked pretty good to me. He had good energy. Wasn't really smooth, but really nice energy. Javin Delorier uh, uh, came out and had some really nice moves. Um, O'Connell kind of had this geeky thing working for him. Uh, he sort of, I, I sort of felt like I was watching the White Urkel. Um, but Alex O'Connell, I thought was pretty good. Wendell Carter, definitely. Uh, he came out to soldier boy and, and he could definitely dance well, but I thought Trent was the, the, the best of any of them and honorable mention, even though Gary Trent was the best dancer, the best intro was unquestionably Antonio Vrankovic, who struts out with the entire team kneeling right next to him. And the, the audio that he strutted out to was the, the, opening theme of Game of Thrones. Uh, Frank did not dance at all. You can't dance to the Game of Thrones theme, but uh, it, it, it really set him up. He is a gladiator, and uh, I thought that was awesome. Sam, do, do you, you, you said you wanted to mock me for my, my ranking uh, I, of, I, I, of the players, my, yeah? My, yeah, my, my only concern uh, when I knew that you were going to be giving us your rankings was that I was worried you wouldn't give 
uh, your homeboy Wendell Carter enough credit for doing the Soldier Boy dance? Uh, oh no, came he came in at number two. When, yeah, so so the, that the, the the one thing I needed to highlight was Wendell Carter doing the Soldier Boy because um, to to us on the show. That song might not seem like it was that long ago, but that song came out when Wendell Carter was like seven years old or eight years old. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. So, because uh, I, I, I remember it vividly because it came out the, the summer before I went to college. So, it, like, people were still doing it, like, you know, my freshman year at Duke. I specifically remember seeing Taylor King practicing the Soldier Boy dance um, while I was on campus. Um, well, and, so, and speaking, uh, speaking of old, hey, speaking of older songs, Grace and Allen, did you hear this song? Grace and Allen came out too. Well, he came out to he came out to every time we touched. Though he's like, uh, he was just he was just excited about Duke basketball. Oh come on, that's he was like ten when that song was released, and that's no, such but, a cheesy song. It's so bad. Yeah, but they play it. But but Jason, but that's they play the song. It that's, that is Duke the song basketball that game. Play basketball games. You have yeah, to play that one. A, I I don't even I don't even think of that song as a as like a pop song anymore. I think of it as a song they play at Duke games. Um, so I, I remember when it thought... came out in law school and people asked me, Hey, did they play every time we touch when, when you were in college? And I said, no, because the song hadn't come out yet, but since it came out, yeah, it's I... been the song that they play. I, I don't, I don't remember that song coming out. I mean, like I'm old enough to remember that song coming out certainly, but mm-hmm. I, I like, don't specifically remember it like becoming popular. I only remember it because it's a song they play at Duke games. Um, so I right. thought it was fun that Grayson Allen did that because because it means that like he's been paying attention for three years during timeout. Uh, okay, okay, I can buy that. Um, I just, I was just like, oh um, god, it's such a cheesy song. No, I, th- I, I, th- I thought it was a great pick. I, I you know, it kind of, kind of brought everything together. You know, all the freshmen who are there like don't know yet um, that they have to be able to jump around to, to every time we touch when they play it in the second half at a critical moment during a timeout. So uh, I, I thought that was great, but I was just really thrilled about about Wendell Carter um, bringing back a dance that that really, you know, has a lot of meaning for me as somebody who went to college in the you know in the late um, twenty aughts, I suppose. I was really disappointed that Trevon Duval didn't even attempt to dance; like he just kind of came out and you know played yeah. the crowd a little bit because he is a yeah. freak athlete. As we saw, you know, and maybe we should actually start talking about what we saw. But <laughs> as we sure. saw during the blue white game and the and the uh, and the slam dunk contest, I mean, Trevon Duval is a crazy athlete, and you'd think someone as smooth as that would be a great dancer, but he didn't even try to dance. I was very disappointed. Yeah, I think that um, maybe it's intimidating on that stage because, you know, a lot of those guys, like, they're used to performing in front of audiences, but they're used to doing a very specific thing that doesn't involve looking at the audience while they're performing. So um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how comfortable all of them necessarily are at being in front of the crowd and dancing. Um, so I'll, I'll give them, especially the freshmen, the benefit of the doubt. Grayson and Allen and, and the other experienced guys, Rankovich, they should all be very used to doing something like this because they've been they've been at duke and in the spotlight for for years now so uh I'll, I'll i'll give a pass to any of the freshmen who didn't perform as well as maybe they they should be able to given their general athletic ability see I, to, to close this out i i just want to say i think i think uh jason was a little hard on the team i think the guys here's the thing i this the dancing that they're doing is very modern you know hip-hop dancing is stuff that you know i didn't grow up with but it's stuff that you know this type of dancing is is what the norm is now. But what I can always pick out, the, some of these guys who did not dance, I can tell cannot dance. And there was a point where they said, all right, I'm going to go out here. I'm going to pretend like I'm going to set some set everybody up for some dancing, and I'm just going to run over and high-five the cam crazies. And that's what they did. Like, Jack I mean, White, he came he, out, and he was like, I'm about to do something, y'all. It's going to be sweet. And he kind of just pointed to the sky and said, that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to exit stage, stage right. And that's why he was supposed to they all be – they they should all be capable of dancing because they can all dribble a basketball really fast, right? Well, a lot of the I mean, dancing was them just pretending to dribble a basketball and just you know right. throwing a little pop lock into it, which is fine. I'm okay but if with you have that. if you have the rhythm if you have the rhythm to dribble a basketball, you should be able to dance. Um, you should be, I, but I, you know, I I, I don't really, know. Really, I'm not really very good at basketball, so maybe they're really really terrible yeah. at dancing as a result. Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Hey, let's Donald. Let's uh, let's talk about the game. Yeah, let's actually talk about the game. So uh, it started out kind of slow, and, and the scrimmage ended with Blue winning forty three to forty one. Um, there's you know a lot you can take from all these sides. So 
Uh, first of all, I'm going to start with you, Sam. Sam, did you have the the, the point guards in this situation? Because I want to talk about yeah, those. Yeah, so I, I I wanted to we, – we, we had agreed before the show, I guess, for the audience's uh, notice that – we, we each have kind of different players or, or things we want to discuss. Um, so the, the thing that I wanted to focus on was the two young uh, guards, specifically the ones I think Jason's going to going to talk about uh, Alex O'Connell at length for some reason. But um, I'm going to I'm going to focus on the freshman guards who we think are going to be getting a lot of minutes, which are Gary Trent and Trayvon Duvall. So we already touched on Trayvon Duvall in the in the uh, dancing discussion. And he didn't score a lot of points. I think it was only four points. Uh, he did have three assists on the day. Um, but what I what I did note about both Duvall and Trent was this enormous athletic ability that for Trent translated to points in the game. He made three for five from three. He scored 13 points. Um, so Trent had a little more scoring than Duvall did. But from both of them, you could see a lot of really great fluid movement. Both of them are able to get in the lane. Duvall seems like he's going to he's gonna turn into a pretty good passer. Um, and I think that the, you know, one of the scary things about the one-and-done era when Duke kind of started uh, recruiting these, these kids and, and having them only come in for a year or two before leaving is that you worry that, like, they might not be able to catch up to the speed of the game um, before they before they departed for the NBA. and and from watching those two guys on on Friday night, um, that's not. I don't think that's a concern at all. I don't think that the the athleticism and the speed is what's going to stop them. I think that some of the experiences uh, and and Duval certainly made a few mistakes um, handling the ball uh, that I think are going to get corrected. But the you can see um, why it's not probably such a such a challenge for Duke to be limited in the. Um, in the, in the guard rotation because those guys are so athletic. And I think that like, you know, Justice Winslow or like Tyus Jones, they're going to be able to integrate pretty quickly into the game plan. And it also gives me hope that despite the fact that they, you know, are freshmen and generally it takes freshmen longer to develop on defense, the fact that they're both athletic and pretty long um, gives us maybe some hope that, that the defense won't be uh, so bad kind of, early in the season the way it's been the last few years. Um, that being said, I mean, the, both teams scored over 40 points. It, it's kind of hard to take away what, what you see from the defense in these games. And, and in particular, I think the thing that we should be, that, that we should be discounting, and again, I know that Jason's going to talk about Alex O'Connell, is how good the kind of second-tier players perform in general in these games relative to the first-tier guys because they're all familiar with each other. Um, and so be it, you know, looking back in the past, guys like Brian Zubek or Marty Poshis, who had big, you know, uh, countdown to craziness or blue white game performances early in their careers, you have to kind of step back and realize they're doing this against the guys that they play against every day in practice. So everyone is really familiar with everybody else's styles and and uh, and you know the, the the ways that they prefer to play. Um, so some of the kind of talent might be overshadowed by guys who are paying a little bit more attention and, and know what they can get away with and what they can't in practice. I can't believe that you just, I can't believe that you just talked about those guys and you didn't mention Trevon Duvall's lob to himself, which was one of the most oh. ridiculous things I've seen so, in a game. So, I mean, I know it's a practice I, game, but wow. It was, it, yeah. If you, again, if you didn't see it, um, it was, it, it was fabulous. Uh, it was stupid. Um, because in the in the context of a game, he would be thrown out immediately. But um, I get, I mean, and it was also in like the closing like two minutes of the of the scrimmage, right? When he did that, yeah. Um, and it, but it was a so, close. It was a close game at that point. It was a close game, right? Um, Coach K, but, Coach like, K would have benched him for a month for doing that in a real game. Well, <laughs> do you remember? It, it was it was when I was in school, the year that Elliot Williams was a freshman. Um, he got some playing time at the end of one game, and I don't remember who the opponent was, but he, he, did he like stole the ball and went for the, and, and he went for the, for the breakaway dunk and did a 360 dunk. And, and there were, I think there were only like 40 seconds or 60 seconds left in the game, but coach Kate called a timeout to put him on the bench for that. Yep. Um, yeah. I, I mean, obviously th this is not the same thing. We, there are referees and a crowd and everything, but um, yeah, it, it was awesome. Um, uh, not everybody can, can throw the ball off the backboard in 
transition like that and catch it and dunk it. So uh, I think that, you know, I, well, it, it, it kind of leads me back to one other point that I meant to make, which is that the, I think one of the concerns going into this season that we have talked about and that is, is going to be a theme that I'm sure we'll talk about more is the lack of outside shooting on this team. Um, like I said, Trent had actually a nice day shooting from outside. O'Connell did as well. We know that Grayson Allen can shoot, but I think that relative to other Duke teams in the past that have been very reliant on the three-pointer, this team is going to be a lot more reliant on, on the inside game. And again, I think that, that these guards um, with their athletic ability and with their ability to drive and, and in Duvall's case, um, hopefully make some good passes uh, should negate some of that lack of, of outside game. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more, even more, a lot more dunks uh, than we have seen in years past from Duke teams, you know, kind of minus the, the Mason Plumlee experience. I think with that Duval uh, lobbed or alley to himself, uh, I imagine Coach K was probably like, I don't know if you guys have seen Major League uh, where um, – uh, Willie Mays Hayes makes like a, a basket catch in, in center field and he comes off the field in the inning and the coach goes, that was a great, great play. Never freaking do it again. That was probably yeah. coach K uh, after that Duval dunk. Like you had your fun tonight, but you, that, that's, that's right. Last, that's, that's where you're going to leave is, it. You're going to leave is, it right there. This is your last opportunity to have fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No zero fun. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Jason, you were going to talk about the Atlanta connection. Uh, the, the four guys that we have from the Atlanta area. So why don't you talk about them? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm from Atlanta, and uh, uh, we have we have four guys who who I thought uh, each had some uh, some really interesting developments that um, that will matter this season that we that we saw um, in this scrimmage. Um, I, you know, I'll sort of go from bottom to top with them, um, and not in terms of the recruiting ranking because Jordan Tucker was the second highest rated of our, of our Atlanta recruits. The four Atlanta guys are, of course, Wendell Carter Jr., Jordan Tucker, um, Alex O'Connell, and Jordan Goldwire. Um, and Jordan Tucker was the second highest rated of those guys. And a lot of people really thought that Tucker was going to, um, you know, perhaps find his way into the rotation, that he would be sort of the, the backup guy on the perimeter. Um, you know, once any one of our uh, starting guards went out, that Tucker would be the next guy to come in because he came in with a reputation of, as a great three-point shooter. Um, Tucker barely played in this game. Um, he, he only had six minutes, and he, he just he hit one of two three-pointers, which is what he's there for. But he, he didn't impact the game in any other way than, you know, taking a couple three-pointers. And uh, he just did not seem, you know, you guys talked about the speed of the game. I think the speed of the game was overwhelming Jordan Tucker a little bit. Uh, Jordan Goldwire, who everyone thought, um, you know, was this afterthought recruit, came in very, very, very late in the process um, and was just supposed to be, you know, he's a four-year guy. He's like not even ranked in the top 200, I don't think. Jordan Goldwire looked like he could be a player for Duke. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not saying he's going to play very much this year, uh, but I think it's possible. Look, in theory, I don't know that we have a backup point guard to Trevon Duval. I, I guess probably Grayson Allen. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll play some backup point guard, but if for some reason we had to go to Jordan Goldwire, I, I don't think it would be a disaster. Um, he, Jason, he, I think like, he, I, I was going to jump in to say that I thought he looked, you know, really, really good and really smooth. And, and I agree with you in the sense that, you know, he may not get a lot of playing time at first, but he seems like the kind of kid that could really earn it, you know, going forward and, and being one of those guys, not, you know, at the early part of the season, but it, towards the middle getting more playing time because I thought he looked like he belonged on the court when, when he was playing. Those were the exact words I, I, I wrote in my notes. I said, Goldwire looks like he belongs. Um, I, he was a pest on defense, which I, I thought, uh, you know, it, it, that's, that's going to be his role. I mean, yeah. And that's how we know get you on the court in the system. If you can play defense, yeah. you may not, you may have some offensive deficiencies, but if you can play defense, you're going to stay on the court. I mean, look, he scored so eight points. So it's, so it's not like, he didn't do anything offensively, but, but yeah, if he gets a role, it's going to be as a defensive pest. And I think he can, he can do that. Yeah. Sam, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that we haven't, so we're going to do a, like a full season preview, I think in a couple of weeks, probably before the regular season starts. Um, if you guys want to throw a prediction on Jordan Goldwire's minutes this season on that prediction list, I will take the under whatever pick you make. But 
uh, I, I, I agree that I was excited about, about seeing kind of one of the lesser known guys um, shine a little bit in that game. Yeah, so uh, the other two Atlanta guys that I want to talk about are the guys that, um, that, uh, that really shined. Um, one is Alex O'Connell, uh, who talk about, you, know, you want to talk about a guy who looked like he belonged. Um, uh, there are a lot of folks who, after seeing the way Alex O'Connell played, he had eight points. Um, he was really in the flow of the game. Uh, and and uh, there are a fair number of people who, um, after watching this game, think that Alex O'Connell, and, and I, I, I'm not sure I disagree with it, they really think that Alex O'Connell um, is going to be Duke's like seventh or eighth man here. Um, I don't know about seventh, but I really think he could be our eighth man. Uh, he certainly looked uh, better, more capable of of filling in and playing some minutes than than either Jack White or Jordan Tucker did. And those are sort of the guys that he would probably be competing with um, along with Frankovic. But Frank is, you know, that's a completely different set of circumstances because he's a strictly a big man, strictly a center. And we're talking about about wings here. Uh, Alex O'Connell, I thought, looked really good. He he showed no nerves at all in this game. Uh, took the ball into the lane a couple times. I thought he looked good doing that. And he hit the game-winning shot. Um, Trevon, uh, the, the, the game-winning shot for the blue team um, is a three-pointer that O'Connell hits with about 20 seconds left. And he does it after Duval drives the lane and draws the defense and then throws the ball out to O'Connell on the wing. By the way, I thought Duval did a great job of relocating the ball over long distance, which is something Duke has not done a lot of lately without having real natural point guards. One of the things Duval is able to do is um, he's able to, to, to pass not just short passes, but long passes. And he makes a long pass to O'Connell who buries the three pointer to win the game. Um, and, and, you know, Alex O'Connell, you know, Alex O'Connell absolutely belonged on the floor. Um, we should probably do a over under on Alex O'Connell minutes uh, as well, but I, I, I won't be at all surprised based on what we saw this game. I, I think this guy could easily play five minutes or so per game in, in competitive games, which, which, you know, I would not have expected a few days ago. And then the last of the Atlanta guys is of course, Wendell Carter Jr. Um, God, I thought he looked, he, he looked really nice. He, he had 11 points um, for the, for the winning blue team. They seem to they seem to feed him the ball both in the post and on the perimeter without any hesitation. There were a lot of Duke fans on the boards, especially when when Wendell Carter committed. Folks said he's going to be our center. He's going to be exclusively in the post. And I said I was one of the few folks who said this guy can step outside. This guy can hit three pointers. He was one of two on three pointers. This guy can can put the ball on the floor and move around a bit. Um, and I said, I think he can definitely play a stretch four kind of role for Duke. He can play power forward. And there's little question at this point that that's, that's a role he's going to play. And he looked very, very comfortable in it. I thought he looked incredibly good when he had the ball on the outside. Um, and I, I really liked his ability to pass the ball when he had it. Um, I thought all Duke's big men, um, especially Bagley, I'm not going to get into Bagley too much because I, I think that Donald's got the, got the other big men, but um, Duke, Duke's interior passing and, and high-low passing was, was fabulous in this game. Um, and, and Carter was a huge, huge part of that. Um, I, you know, he, he looked like the stud that we all expected him to be. All right, so Donald, tossing it over to you now. Get, get, get me the other big guys, Delorier, Bagley, um, and, and, and so on. Well, you touched a lot on it when you were talking about, uh, and this is one thing that I took away, not only from what I saw, but from the comments uh, about the game and about the big men. They're going to have to be very good at passing the basketball uh, because in this offense, you know, we talked about this a couple episodes ago. We're going to have some instances where Coach K may throw three big guys uh, at an opponent, which means one of those guys is going to need to be able to pass the ball uh, and, and play from the perimeter. We saw a little bit with Wendell Carter. He can play outside. You know, I, I thought, you know, Bolden, I didn't think had a great night, but I thought he did really well at moving around on the perimeter a lot better than he did last year. And I think that it, just having that is going to stretch a defense out to the point where it'll allow people inside to be able to shine. I thought Marvin Bagley had a great, great night. Um, you know, he looked impressive. He, he looked every bit, it, it, you know, you say the hype around him. The hype was every bit as real last night, I thought, for him, because his game was so smooth. It's very, very fluid. He, he knows where to be on the court. He knows where his teammates are. And even when some of the things that he messed up on, it was more a sense of, you know, by the time the season starts, that's going to click. And, and I think that he is just about there when it comes to being one of the you know, best freshmen in the country. I thought I saw that last night uh, uh, from Marvin Bagley III. Um, 
Marquise Bolden, I think, is going to have to improve a lot on his finishing uh, and, and just, you know, his all around court awareness. But I thought what he did last night was very promising, given some of the things that we saw last year and some of the, the, the issues that he had with staying on the court. I, I didn't see a lot of that last year. So I think he's grown. I think he's improved. He seemed more um, what, confident. Didn't you think he yeah, seemed more that, confident? That's the word, confidence. That's, yeah. That's, that's exactly what you're going to need. Yeah, that's the exact word. I, I think I – go ahead. I, I really saw that with Bolden, particularly on defense. And mm-hmm. and we know that I mean, th- this point has kind of been de-emphasized the last few years as there have been more freshmen in the program. But we've talked about it on the show before how Coach K likes to give guys minutes based on how well they're playing defense. And Bolden, you know, playing against – guys like Carter and Bagley who are going to be really good ACC big men and really good national college basketball big men. Um, he didn't, he didn't seem like he was shying away from, from, you know, bodying up on them and, and, and making him work on offense. So, uh, so I, I, I feel a lot more confident. Like you guys said, the, 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 the confidence definitely has improved for, for Bolden. Really quick. I was let, let's be clear about Duke's Duke's big men. Um, these the the five guys who are going to get minutes, you know, and I'm including Vrankovic in that. But Delorier, Carter, Bagley, and Bolden, and Vrank. This is the best big man unit in college basketball, and it's probably not even close. Um, and for for these guys to to play as well as they did offensively and defensively against this kind of competition was, I think, a really big deal and, and a very good sign. I mean, most of the it, – it's going to be very rare that Marquise Bolden is going up against someone as good as Wendell Carter or Javin Delorier. Uh, I, just, right. I just think, you know, it, it's a great sign for him um, uh, to, to, to be able to play that well. Yeah, and, and I think when you, when you mention the word confidence, I think, you know, with Bolden, there's a couple times, you know, he got a couple personal fouls. And last year, if he got a foul – he would basically, you would see him kind of turn to the bench as to say, well, I'm coming out. Right. And you didn't see that with him. You know, he, he played all 20 minutes in in the scrimmage. So what you like to see is when someone has something bad happen to him, you know, the term next play really means next play, you shake it off, you get to the next play and you try to redeem yourself for the next, the next time down the, not down the court. And I thought he did really well at that. If he did something where he didn't get a good shot off or, uh, he did. He made a bad pass or something like that. He gets back on defense and he says, OK, I'm going to, you know, redeem myself down here in this end. And that'll translate to uh, to our team on the offense. So I thought he did really well at being confident of being on the court. If something he did something, he did something 100 percent. If he messed up, he he just said, OK, next time I got I got your back. And I think that's what you need to see from him, especially when we have these three, you know, two or three big men. Uh, lineups that we're going to probably see early on the season as, as a test on Jeff Delorier's part. I thought he didn't do well offensively, but he did especially well defensively. Um, we're going to need his uh, athleticism on the defensive glass. And you could tell last night that here on, on Friday night, I'm sorry, that he has that athleticism to, to pull down rebounds and get everybody out on the transition. He had nine total rebounds. Um, he had three of them on the offensive end. And one thing that, that leads me into is something that was coming up early on the broadcast. Um, They were talking about how uh, we weren't very good at offensive rebounds last year. We, we took a lot of threes, but it was a lot of trips where we, if we miss a three, we were coming back on defense. We're obviously not going to be as good a shooting team this year as we were last year. We're going to be a lot more physical on the inside. That's going to lead to a lot of offensive rebounds. We had nine, each team had nine offensive rebounds last night. And I think that is going to be the key. If we're active, these guys are active on the inside, getting loose balls, getting rebounds, that's going to turn to easy points for us. And I think one thing that I saw last night from the bigs, from Delorier, from Bagley, and from Bolden, that I think is going to translate really well is that athleticism on the glass. Because if we can get those balls, turn them into points, those are going to be easy, not only easy baskets for us, but momentum killers for the other team and just outright demoralization uh and if they you know if you get a re- off his rebound put it back up for a slam that's going to really demoralize an opponent uh because uh, again it happened to us a lot last year and we want to make sure that that is going to be the team we're uh, we're get, dishing out the damage this year and i think those guys were really good at that i'm really looking forward to see what i uh see more of that going down the road I, I think your assessment of our bigs was was dead on target uh, one thing i loved was 
their ability to pass. Um, and I mentioned this already, but I, I, they never panicked when they were double teamed. And uh, Javin Delore had three assists. Um, you're right, his his offensive game, you know, didn't seem too great, but you know, a couple block shots, uh, all those rebounds, three assists. Um, he he's bringing athleticism to the table. Uh, and he not, had this feel, so it's like he's a stat stuffer. And that's yeah, and exactly. Every every great team has a stat stuffer who does not like. If Javin Delory has some games where he has like three points, but has like ten boards and and two blocks and five assists and a couple steals. That's that's going to be great for us. I don't know. He's going to. I don't think he's got many games like that because I don't know he's going to get that much playing time to get those mm-hmm. kind of numbers. But, um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, I I, I think if if Delore is playing, you know, I think he's going to play maybe around ten minutes a game. And if he's grabbing, you know, if he's grabbing four or five rebounds in those ten minutes, maybe blocking a shot or two and getting an assist or two. Yeah, you're right. He doesn't need to score because we're going to have other guys who can score. Well, and the rebounding is going to be really important this year because the shooting isn't probably going to be as good as it normally is. Um, so look for all those big guys um, to be rebounding a lot, but particularly on offense where we're going to have to get second chance points in a lot of cases because um, I don't think we're going to see kind of the same efficiency that we've seen in years past. It, it might look honestly more like UNC's team has the last couple of years where they've just relied almost totally on offensive rebounding to create offense for them. They did mention that on the on the broadcast where they said last year that they were terrible from from the perimeter, but they got so many offensive yeah. rebounds that it turned into easy baskets. That that could be us. I year. mean, they won they they won a national championship with what Joel Berry as their as their point guard, right? Um, so it can be done, um, and it can be done in in today's game. I want to ask you guys in one second who the biggest surprise was. What, what was the thing that surprised you the most? But um, before, I, I wanted to just mention, uh, I, I, one of you, I think Sam mentioned um, uh, Zubek. Greg Zubek had a, uh, sorry, Brian Zubek had a huge. That'd be Brian, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Greg, Greg, Greg Kubek was before my time. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. clears throat> Brian Zubek had a huge game at Countdown to Craziness once uh, a few years ago. Uh, I think it, it may have even been his freshman year. Um, it, yeah, it was, was he, his, it was his freshman season, which was the 2006 year when we lost to VCU. Right. And, and he, <laughs> he was, he was not a player during, I mean, like he had this huge game at countdown to craziness. And then he, he basically was a non-factor all season. He was a non-factor most of his career until, uh, you know, sort of midway through his senior season when he turned into one of the greatest offensive rebounders college basketball has ever seen. But I, I bring this up to, to note that. Uh, you know, we, you don't want to read too much into Countdown to Craziness. I mean, two years ago when he was a freshman, Chase Jeter had 11 points and nine rebounds in Countdown to Craziness. And uh, he was a very highly touted recruit. And you would have sworn at that point that Chase Jeter was going to go on to become a stud for Duke on the inside. And now he's gone. Um, uh, last year, Marcus Bolden had, had a really good um, Countdown to Craziness. He had He led the whole team. He had seven rebounds. Um, he was altering shots, and and everyone thought he would um, be a significant, significant player for us, and and he barely got off the bench most of last year. Um, Jack White was two for two on three pointers last season, and many folks thought he was going to, you know, find a role for himself on the team. And Jack White never got off the bench. So here I am, you know, I, I spent all this time raving about Alex O'Connell and how he looks like he belongs, and Jordan Goldwire, and how he looks like he could, you know, scrap out a minute or two here as a backup. And and uh, history tells us that countdown to craziness sometimes shows things that don't uh, end up being real. But let me let me so let me put my question back to you guys again, Donald. You first. What or who surprised you the most from from the scrimmage? Uh, I think the most surprising. So I I'll break it down to mainly two parts. One, uh, I I was surprised at how like I said, that Jordan Goldwire belonged on the court uh, at, at a lot of times during the uh, scrimmage. Um, I thought he played really well. And it's, it's interesting to me because when we're talking about all these incoming uh, freshmen, we weren't really, I mean, we were discussing him, but, you know, well down the line after uh, some of these other big names. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how he can work his way in, onto the court um, this year, or if he does at all. Um, but I thought I, I really liked what I saw from him. The one thing that I will mention that I thought was a, as a surprise we've talked about it um but i didn't think you know i was surprised at how well we shot from three um you know we we've talked about the fact that this team may not shoot as many threes or make as many threes and not be as good an outside shooting team but if you again you talked about 
Countdown to Craziness translating to the season. If you turned on Countdown to Craziness, you'd think we we are just as good a shooting team as we have been in years past because we, you know, the teams shot very well uh, from the outside. So, uh, you know, as far as making them. Um, but I think that's going to be interesting to see how that breakdown uh, occurs going forward, especially when we have so many big men who are ready to contribute. Sam, what'd you, what, what was the most surprising thing to you? I think the Alex O'Connell shooting and, like you said, his generally looking like he belonged surprised me. Um, and I will sort of follow up on what you said about overreacting to, um, to Countdown to Craziness and thinking about how all these guys at the end of the bench are going to get lots of playing time by uh, pointing listeners to, you know, I think we like, we like to highlight um, good discussion that happens at the DBR forums. Um, one of my favorite recurring uh, segments, I guess, on the or topics on the th- on the forum is uh, when, when we do what we call the phase posts, which we here on the show don't really break down the season into phases the way that they do on the board. Um, but I think it's a nice way that we um, we kind of segment the season in, into different uh, into the different phases. I think there are like six or seven of them throughout the season. And uh, anyway, so the first phase post just went up, I think, last week. And uh, one of our favorite posters, Kedzie, uh, who does a lot of really great in-depth analysis on the board, uh, wrote the first phase post and, and did a really interesting rundown of his, like, minutes distribution prediction, which I encourage everybody to go read because it's very, uh, it's very detailed. Uh, if, you, if you like <laughs> getting into numbers, um, it, it's fun that way. But it also is a nice splash of cold water on sort of any of your fantastic ideas about who's getting playing time. And, um, and so Kedzie kind of breaks down uh, the players by what year they are and, and where their, recruitings went, their recruiting rankings were um, and notes how well those two things correlate to playing time. Um, so go check that out. It's really interesting. And I think it'll kind of dampen sort of whatever expectations people could have about Goldwire or O'Connell, um, maybe even Vrankovic or Delorier. So uh, it's really interesting stuff, and 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 to remind everybody that that the the forums do produce a lot of uh, a lot of good discussion. So my most surprising thing, Donald stole the first one. I was going to say I was shocked by how many three pointers we took. Um, yeah, you know, on the white team, which was Bagley, White, Bolden, Allen, Goldwire, and Tucker, every single player attempted at least one three pointer. Even Marcus Bolden took a three pointer. I mean, you know, how shocking is that? Um, the fact that we attempted 32, 32 total three-pointers in, in one half. Now, granted, we are both offense and defense. We, we were both teams, but um, that's just a 32 is a lot of three-pointers. Um, uh, and, and I did not expect Duke to be shooting that much from the outside because the, the word was supposed to be that aside from Trent and Allen, we just weren't going to be a team to, to take a lot of uh, three-pointers. But, you know. I, I, I like seeing it because it's a very efficient way to score the basketball if you shoot it well, and we did shoot it well. But the thing I was going to say that surprised me the most was the makeup of the teams, and specifically this. Grayson Allen and Marvin Bagley were on the same team. And I would have really thought, you know, the theory always is you divide up your best players, you know, if you're going to try and make balanced teams. And um, Grayson Allen and Marvin Bagley are, are almost certainly the two best players uh, for Duke this season, at least that's what, um, you know, everyone who follows college basketball would have you believe. And the fact that they were both placed in the same team, I thought was really, really interesting. And to me, it says something about what the coaches have seen from Wendell Carter and Trevon Duvall and Gary Trent, and perhaps also Javin Delorier, who were all on the other team. They, uh, th- those were really the best guys on the other team. And I think it says something about what the coaches have seen from those guys that they felt those guys together along with Rankovic and O'Connell um, would, would, would be able to handle, and they ended up beating, they ended up winning, but they'd be able to handle the, the Allen and Bagley juggernaut on the other side. And so that to me was very surprising and very interesting. Okay. I think that's going to do it for countdown to craziness. Uh, But before we get into football, uh, I'm going to kick it to Jason because Jason's going to talk about uh, a cool commercial that came on uh, or debuted, I guess, last week prior to the start of the NBA season. Jason, tell us about this uh, new commercial. So this was just fabulous. Nike just introduced this a few days ago. Um, they've been running it. Uh, they ran it on the NFL. They've run it on some NBA games. 
Um, it is a, a commercial that that starts with a little kid holding on to a basketball. And as he looks into the distance, um, he sees sort of his basketball career play out in front of him. Um, and, and Sam, I, I believe you have not seen this commercial yet. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. So I'm going to, we intentionally had Sam not watch this commercial. Um, uh, and so Sam's going to go away for a moment and he's going to watch the commercial while Donald and I talk about it a little bit more. Then we're going to get Sam's live reaction to this commercial. Um, but anyway, the, the, the way the commercial continues, that the kid sort of envisions himself um, eventually playing with LeBron James. Well, at first he's playing with LeBron in like a... Like uh, a LeBron's like a, camp. Yeah, like a, a camp or a clinic. The, the commercial is called Want It All. If folks, if you want to go out there and look at it, it's called Want It All. And um, so the kid at first is playing in this little camp with LeBron. And then we see the kid sort of progressing through high school onto college and eventually to the NBA. And uh, at the very end of the commercial, um, he and LeBron are passing the ball to each other as they're taking on the Golden State Warriors, presumably for the NBA title. And and LeBron ends up feeding the kid for an off the backboard, backboard slam dunk that the kid puts in. Um, and uh, and he wins the, the NBA title alongside LeBron James. But the really cool part, the reason this connects to Duke is the middle of the commercial is the kid committing to college and then playing in college. And he commits to Duke and he plays for Duke. And I think it's significant. I mean, look, Duke is a Nike school and Nike wants to promote Duke. We've talked, in, <laughs> we've talked on the podcast a lot lately about how the shoe companies are very invested in the schools that, that they support. Um, Adidas and Louisville being the one that we've mostly talked about, but Nike is, is very into Duke University and supporting Duke. But Nike has a lot of other programs, a lot of other schools. And uh, I think it's a really big deal that they picked Duke for this. The, the, the commercial makes it absolutely clear um, if you are a stud, stud, stud recruit, the Duke is the place to go. <laughs> and I, I loved it for that aspect of it. It's a, re it's a great commercial. It's a lot of fun as a commercial as well. Um, but, but it is, I mean, a huge recruiting tool for Duke. And to some extent, because LeBron is featured so prominently in it, and LeBron, of course, went high school straight to the NBA, he's never had a college program. It feels to me like uh, th this, this commercial is, is him endorsing duke as well um i can't imagine that any kid considering duke basketball hasn't been exposed to this commercial by the duke coaching staff because it's a it's a great recruiting tool I, I, am, am i right donald oh it absolutely is um you know just the fact that you you talk about a kid who and, and i think there's a couple of nuances that that you left out that i want to touch on i think first one you know we're talking about how as a kid this kid is at the lebron james camp or whatever this clinic and LeBron is teaching him how to throw a behind the back pass. And he teaches the, he teaches the kids how to do it and says, who wants to do it with me and picks the kid. Uh, and the kid comes up and does it. And basically they're walking down the court and that correlates to the end of the uh, end of the commercial where to get to uh, the basket, um, the kid dribbles and then throws a behind the back pass to LeBron that he had been taught by LeBron as a kid. So I thought that was a really cool corollary in, in the commercial to tie it all together, but also just the fact that it is Duke. Um, it, it looks like Cameron indoor stadium. There's no coach K on the sideline. It's generic players. Um, there's one player that's wearing number 46, which obviously you can't wear in college, like things, little small things like that make it kind of funny. Uh, and, and part of the commercial is, you know, the guy, uh, the kid, instead of taking a shot passes it. Um, and, it gets blocked by what appears to be an army player uh, for us to lose at home. Um, and he kind of uses that as motivation to get better. Um, and then the next time he's playing some team, he takes the shot and makes the shot for the, for the buzzer beater. So uh, I, I think it's uh, it was a really cool commercial and it does highlight Duke prominently for about 30, 35 seconds. And especially when the, the condensed version is what you see on TV, it really touches in on Duke for most of the commercials. So that is obviously a great recruiting tool. Uh, and something that, you know, really, really highlights uh, that, hey, you know, these guys, when they're coming to the league, they should just they, they should go to Duke because that is a that is a school that will prepare you for moments like this. Sam, Sam are you, what'd you think? Yeah. What'd you think of the commercial, yep. Sam? I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I had your commentary running underneath the <laughs> the sound of the commercial, which was interesting because you kind of spoiled it for me as I was watching it. But uh, but I still enjoyed it. I I, I um 
I would have criticized their use of the number 10 for a player, but now that uh, Marvin Bagley is wearing 35, I guess that that's, that's going to be okay um, uh, going forward. But uh, no, I, and I, 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 I mean, your, your general take about how, about how Duke kind of fits into the, you know, to the whole progression is, is, is really cool. And I think is a strong recruiting tool. Um, uh, and, and I like the, you know, having, having some kind of challenge and having the haters doubt you and all that stuff. And then, and then coming back and getting better. Um, you know, you can, you can see that sort of thing happening to, to probably any college player who, who gets a lot of hype and, and, uh, and is expected to do big things when they come to school. Um, so I, I, I'm pumped about it. I'm also surprised, I guess, that coach K didn't make an appearance because, um, you know, he has his own contract with Nike to, to do, you know, the, the merchandising and stuff with them. Um, so I'm surprised they didn't drag him in for it. Um, and I also didn't know that Durham had downtown uh, basketball courts that looked like the one in the commercial. Yeah. I, I don't know where that, where they, where yeah, they I, I don't know what that is. I don't but, think but, it was but I, Durham I, at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose think... that the, I suppose the, the reality doesn't have to be exactly, uh, exactly true. I don't right. think the kid, the kid wasn't supposed to be from Durham. I think he's just from no, but, any place. Yeah. But if he was, but, but if he's a one and done, I mean, maybe he's a, maybe he's not a one and done kid. Maybe we've, we've, this is sometime in the future when they've changed the one and done, or maybe he's staying <laughs> longer because he's Grayson Allen, but presumably the, the missed shot to the next, to the, to the making the shot happened in the middle of the season. So maybe he went home for winter break and was playing outside in the middle of winter. I don't know. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to break it down too hard for that regard. I think that you guys uh, touched on kind of all the important points and uh, I don't know, it, it is really cool. And it does it, even the, the long version is think like Donald, you mentioned the uh, kind of the made for TV version of it, but the long version really focuses on Duke a lot. And, and uh, you know, in that at the end when they have the flashback or when the flashback or when the flash forward ends, I suppose. And it, you know, comes back to the, what I guess is the present day. Um, he, uh, you know, it, it, it flashes right back through Duke. So it's like, if you want to play in the NBA against Kevin Durant and with LeBron James, you're going to do that by going to Duke. Um, so that, that part was cool. Um, how, uh, how much do you guys think John Calipari dislikes this campaign? quite a bit (laughs) like do you think do you think he called like his nike guys and was like guys come on do we do we need this was this was this necessary um i i'd like to think there were a handful of of nike coaches who who were not thrilled about about this commercial coming out not honestly that i think it's going to make so much of a difference but but you know every every little bit is something well it just reinforces it reinforces this notion that that has happened over the past several years with Duke's, you know, really almost unprecedented recruiting success. Um, it reinforces the notion that you know if you're a stud, stud, stud um, in high school, you you want to go to Duke. Yep, and also it, the truth. it it also kind of highlights the property that you know taking out North Carolina because North Carolina is the Jordan brand, and that they they treat those brands separately when it comes to these commercials. But it seems to me that Duke is Nike's highest, highest commodity, hottest commodity when it comes to college basketball. Um, we were talking and, about, and, you know, and, and they're definitely in Louisville, but Duke and Duke and Nike are at this point go hand in hand. And and you could see them making either multiple versions of this commercial where where it's players at different schools, or a much more compressed commercial where it's like you know, a, a neighborhood of, of guys growing up, like, you know, if they all grow up like around Rucker Park or something, and one of them ends up at Duke and one ends up at like, you know, North Carolina or Kentucky or Oregon or any of these other big Nike schools, Arizona. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then like, maybe they like, they all separate and go to different schools and they all come back together and they're like in the NBA. Um, you know, they, they, they could have written it that way, but they chose to write it this way. So, um, uh, you, you, to you know, you. Sam, you, you hit on a good thing. I can't imagine. Can, can you imagine how would we have reacted to this commercial if, if the kid had in a prominent major commercial, like I said, this, this, this is a long spot and it is running all over the place. Nike's running this everywhere. How would we have reacted if the kid had been playing for Kentucky or playing for Carolina or playing for Oregon? I mean, if he's playing for Oregon, which is Nike's home school, so to speak, you, you would have kind of laughed about it. You would have been like, that's a joke. You know, the, the fact that they or, picked Oregon. Or, 
It, well, yeah, for Oregon, it would have been it would have been you know more obvious because Oregon isn't nearly as prominent of a basketball program. I think if they picked Kentucky, it wouldn't wouldn't like. I don't think it would resonate with me the way that it it resonates probably with Kentucky fans that it's a Duke that that, that the thing takes place at Duke. Um, I think it would it would seem it would seem like whatever they they did that thing in Kentucky um, and and Duke doesn't need that anyway. Um, I'd like to think I would say that. Yeah, I I haven't seen the Kentucky version of this commercial that doesn't exist. So um, I would like to think that that it wouldn't phase me kind of the way that I bet other fan bases probably don't like seeing Duke in a commercial. I would say though, I think that if if it was a Kentucky jersey or, or Oregon, I mean Oregon, I, you guys are right. It'd be more like oh Oregon, that makes sense, Nike, whatever. But if it's like you know uh, Kentucky or uh, or or like Arizona. Uh, or something like that. You, Adidas. Arizona is Adidas school. Arizona is now? Oh, or is it, no, Arizona. Yeah, the base switch because Arizona State is. Arizona yeah. State is and UCLA is Adidas. Um, yeah. But I'm pretty sure Arizona is still Nike. Yeah. I thought Arizona but, Arizona is caught in this Adidas scandal, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, but they're it's, not Adidas. Yeah, I, oh, that's right. That's right. It's a, not, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. It's, yeah it, it, it's a different thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but the, the, whole, the whole point is if, if, if it's one of those schools and it's on TV, no one's talking about the commercial being a recruiting tool. I think it's because it's us right. that people would say, oh, it's really convenient that Duke's on there. They're going to be able to use this to recruit players because it, it seems like for people, they, they think that us, the only way we can recruit these big guys is if we're on TV and, and on these commercials and, and hanging out with uh, having LeBron, you know, highlight, you know, give us a shout out or Kobe. It, it really is a school. And, and the school is re- what Nike is saying is that, hey, this school, is selling itself. It's not, it's, it's, this is not a recruiting tool. You guys see that yeah. this kid can make it. And this is a plausible commercial because he's wearing a Duke Jersey. And I think that says everything. I love it. I just love it. It's good. I'll watch it again. Hey folks, once again, we want to thank the law firm of Bird Campbell for sponsoring today's DBR podcast. Jamie Campbell and Tucker Bird, both diehard Duke fan, uh, Duke fans and, uh, and alumni. They went to Duke together. In, uh, they were a class of 1978. And just a few years ago, they decided to form a law firm together. Uh, the Bird Campbell Law Firm um, has offices in Dallas, Orlando, and along the Gulf Coast of Florida. These guys have watched Duke football and basketball for many, many years, and they are truly true blue you can reach out to them at birdcampbell.com b-y-r-d-c-a-m-p-b-e-l-l.com and jamie and tucker say go to hell carolina go to hell and now let's shift gears from basketball we will obviously be talking a lot of basketball in the coming weeks as the season kicks into high gear but we want to shift into football and Duke football uh, did not have a good outing again this past weekend. Uh, they played Pitt at home and ended up they, – they started out with the lead and ended up – or I'm sorry, they, they started out with a, a down. They got the lead in the third quarter and thought everything was going well, and then they let it all collapse in the fourth quarter. Duke loses 24-17. to 17. Uh, Jason, I don't really want to talk much about this. It's been, you know, four weeks of the same kind of uh, – staggered authors you know stale offense that we've seen uh but give me your quick thoughts on this game um i am sure that duke offensive co- coordinator zach roper is is a really nice guy um but uh i i i think he's got to go i think we need someone else calling the plays and, and doing the offense it's just it's just terrible um there's so many things that are wrong D- duke's offense is broken Duke's offense at this point is is broken. Um, we're we're not scoring points. We're not executing very well. Uh, we're doing uh, just inexplicable play calling. I, I'm going to give you. Uh, this is going to be an unbelievable statistic. Uh, uh, the the two most talented offensive players for Duke, I think every single person would agree about this, are Sean Wilson and Britton Brown. Am I am I correct about that, Donald? You are absolutely correct. I think all of us agree Sean Wilson and Britton Brown, our two running backs, are the best offensive players for Duke. Do you know how many times they rush the ball in the fourth quarter? How many times our two best offensive players, two running backs, how many times they rush the ball in the entire fourth quarter? One. Zero. 
Zero. Oh, zero. Oh, zero. That, that player at the end of the third. You're right. Go ahead. Zero. Duke, Duke rushed the ball once in the fourth quarter. Quentin Harris came in and ran the ball straight up the middle, as he, as he always does. Um, and, and he lost a yard because, for some reason, we think that Quentin Harris is Brandon Connett, um, uh, and, and he's not. Um, and, and look, Quentin Harris may be able to do things at some point for Duke, but right now, every time Quentin Harris comes in the game, he, he takes the ball, he, uh, almost every time. He, he actually passed once in this game, but for the most part, he takes the ball and he runs it up the middle and Duke loses yardage. And, and it's, it's a wasted play. I don't know why we do it, um, but uh, we waste it down. Uh, how, how, how could we not get the ball to Sean Wilson and Britton Brown the entire fourth quarter? I, I wonder, I think Britton Brown may be hurt or something. There, there's some friends of mine who I email with about this stuff who says that, that you know, that it's sort of inexplicable that Britton Brown isn't getting the ball more and that maybe he he is hurt in some way and that they're just not saying anything about it. But um, it was incredibly frustrating, this game against Pitt, because Duke's better than Pitt. We are. I mean, we are a seven-point favorite in this game. Um, Pitt, Pitt's only in this game because they ran off. They had two plays where they ran the ball up the middle, and for some reason all our linebackers and all our safeties ran to the sidelines. And so – you know, they ran the ball up the middle with with Darren Hall, and he 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 just ran and ran and ran forever, um, and uh, uh, you know, and scored touchdowns. He he got like 160, 170 yards off of two plays, um, that ended up both being touchdowns for him, and that's the whole reason Pitt was even in the game. Yeah, going he had into two. He had two. Um, he had the seventy. Oh, I think it was seventy nine yard touchdown run at the in the first quarter, and, and I thought they had him pretty contained. And then it was the night we we scored, and then pin them inside the 10 and he yeah you're right he ran a, ran off a 92 yard touchdown on the very next play and just crushed any momentum that we had and that was it that was really it from there well uh, you know it, it sort of crushed it because what happened was they then kicked it off and sean wilson returned the kickoff to like almost midfield right and i, I was like okay wait we're still in this we've still got, we still got a good shot at this you know it, it, essentially that kickoff return reversed the momentum again but we promptly you know, we promptly threw a bad incompletion. We we then brought in Quentin Harris, who who ran it up the middle for negative one yard, and then Daniel Jones was in a third and eleven, and we threw another incompletion, and we punted the ball away, and th that was the ball game. It was done at that point. Um, it's such a pity. It, it's uh, this was a very winnable game. Um, uh, Duke at one point was four and zero in the season, and it looked like getting to six wins and getting to a bowl game wasn't going to be much of a problem. Now it looks like it's a huge, huge problem. We're now four and four, and I'm not sure I, uh, other than Army, I'm not sure I see another win on the schedule. Maybe Wake Forest, but Wake's, Wake certainly looks better than Duke at this point. Duke just, we look lost. We don't look good. Should I, should I get to a little bit of a Virginia Tech preview at this well, point? Well, yeah, briefly, I, you know, I, I was going to touch on the, the fact that we just don't, you were talking about confidence in the basketball court. These guys don't have confidence on the football field right now, uh, especially our offense. You know, there's times early in the season where if we needed, it was fourth and three, fourth and four, we were confident enough that we would keep our guys out there, that they would get those three or four yards and, and get the touchdown. Um, or, I'm sorry, and get the first down. And nowadays, they're just not playing with that same confidence. They're not saying with playing with that same level of intensity. Uh, and it really shows because in the you know third and fourth quarter of these games, the the team feels out of it, and when the team when the opponent sees that, they seize on it, and and that's what Pitt did. They they saw that the game was there to be take taken, and they took it, um, and we just let them take it. Uh, and that's something that cannot happen. We're, we're we'll get into Virginia Tech in a second, but we got Virginia Tech coming up. We're at Blacksburg. It's a Saturday night game. That means that the lights are going to be on. The the, the camera is going to be on this team. Can they respond? Can they do something against a really good Virginia Tech team? You have Army after that, and Army should be a good, you know, should be a win. It's at, at West Point, but that should be a win for us. We should not be worried about be, beating Army. If we can't beat Army, then there's there's no more discussion. Georgia Tech, they play really hard. Wake Forest, they play really tough. These guys are going to have to increase their level of intensity going forward, and if they can't do that, we're going to be sitting at home in December watching everyone else play bowl games. Well, and I'm I am very worried about this Virginia Tech game because, uh, folks, I don't know if you saw what happened this past week. Virginia Tech played UNC and they killed Carolina. Literally, the News and Observer ran an obit 
ran an obituary on the Carolina team after the Virginia Tech game. I mean, how how hysterical is that? Andrew Carter, I want to read you the start of Andrew Carter's column. He said, the 2017 North Carolina Tar Heels football season, which began with hope before quickly taking a demoralizing turn and defeat-riddled despair, died on Saturday. It was 49 days old. The exact time of death is not known, but it occurred at some point, likely during the second quarter against Virginia Tech. Uh, and I think that's just hysterical. Uh, Virginia Tech absolutely killed, destroyed the poor Carolina quarterbacks, including Chaz Surratt. Um, Virginia Tech put up six sacks. They had 13 tackles for a loss. They had two interceptions. They had a fumble recovery. Chaz Surratt had a really, I think it was Chaz Surratt, one of the UNC quarterbacks had a really bad fumble. Um, Duke, by the way, has won two in a row at Virginia Tech. <sighs> Boy, I don't think that's going to happen this year. They, Virginia Tech is favored by 15 and a half points. They are a really, really good defensive team. They only give up a little more than 12 points per game on defense. And with our the way our offense has been struggling, I think we're in real trouble. I, 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 I can't figure out how we're going to score on these guys. Um, uh, interesting little note about Virginia Tech. They start a true freshman at quarterback, Josh Jackson, Joshua Jackson. His father played in the NFL. He's not the same Josh Jackson who played for Kansas basketball last year and now for the Phoenix Suns. Different guy, um, but he's been great for them thus far. Uh, the last time Virginia Tech started a true freshman at quarterback was Michael Vick in 1999. And this kid, Josh Jackson, he's not Michael Vick, but he's pretty darn good. He completes 64% of his passes. He's got 16 touchdown passes on the season with only four interceptions. Um, and he's a true dual threat quarterback. He, he will run the ball a decent amount, and he's a pretty good runner. Um, uh, the only hope I think that we have is that maybe Virginia Tech is looking ahead a little bit because a week after they play us, next week, they have Miami in Miami. And that is a huge, huge game. The winner of that game should probably be the winner of the ACC Coastal and get a chance to play um, Clemson for, you know, for, the, uh, for the ACC title. Um, and, and I don't know that Virginia Tech, you know, they may – in addition to looking ahead to Miami, they may be looking and thinking that there's, there's a not unrealistic scenario where Virginia Tech makes the national title game. Um, if, if they run the table, including beating Miami um, at Miami, including beating Clemson in the ACC championship game, um, if Virginia Tech does that, which is not out of the realm of possibility, this is a good team. They're ranked number 13 in the nation. They could find their way into the national title game uh, or into the national title playoffs, I should say. Um, so, so they got a lot that they're playing for. and. Um, I, I sort of think Duke's only hope is that maybe they're looking ahead to Miami too much. I was going to mention that that is something that I, I would hope uh, is the case on Saturday, that they're kind of looking forward to that big, big matchup uh, down in Coral Gables, or I'm sorry, down in Miami Gardens uh, next Saturday, because uh, like you said, at least on the coastal side of things, that will be probably for the coastal championship, uh, if you will. Um you still have Clemson on the other side uh, that is still in good position to make the, the ACC title game. But in all actuality, Virginia Tech knows that they have a shot at getting into this playoff, um, this college football playoff. So will they be looking ahead to that big game? I, I hope so, because maybe that will give us a little, uh, little edge as, as, far, as far as um, um, you know, intensity level. Um, if they lower their intensity and we raise ours, maybe we can be on a level playing field. But this is a really good team. And uh, we're going to have to come up with something very, very special uh, to beat them once again at Blacksburg. And now we're going to move on to parting shots. And I will start with you, Jason. What, what do you got for us? Uh, so my parting shot, um, I, you know, last, last week I talked about a coach that I admired, um, uh, the uh, Oregon State coach, football coach, whose name I blanked on now, but who, uh, who uh, quit um, uh, because his team just wasn't getting the job done. And he gave back $12 million of salary um, that, he was, that he could have easily probably claimed. And um, so this week, I'm again going to highlight a, a coach, not a Duke coach, but a, a different school coach that, that I, I'm admiring on. And, and it will be Idaho State's Bill Evans. Uh, Bill Evans of Idaho State, um, even though he's not a very prominent coach, uh, he is one of the 31 coaches who, uh, who vote in the uh, USA Today coaches poll. And um, this week, they cast their preseason ballots. And Bill Evans of Idaho State 
said um, that he did not consider, he did not rank Arizona, Louisville, USC, Oklahoma State, or or Auburn. Now, Auburn's not very good, but um, Arizona, Louisville, USC, and Oklahoma State uh, are all um, – uh, are all very oh and Miami sorry I forgot to mention Miami also those are all very very good teams um, and and he didn't rank any of them and the reason he didn't was uh, he was talking to his son about voting in the poll and they were talking about the recent scandal the Adidas scandal the scandal involving um, uh, you know uh, players uh, and and assistant coaches and all kinds of folks getting money from agents and financial backers and and especially from shoe companies and he just said that morally he he couldn't. He didn't want to vote for these schools that are caught up in this scandal. Now, Arizona ended up number five in the USA Today poll. USC is number 11, Miami's number 12, and Louisville's number 16. So these are really good teams. And this guy left them completely off his ballot as a way of saying he does not like the way these schools are conducting business and, and the fact that they're caught up in this pretty bad scandal. And, and so I tip my cap to Idaho State's Bill Evans. I think I think that's a good thing to do. I think there should be consequences. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, this is sort of a nothing consequence. Who cares about these polls? Duke was ranked number one, by the way. Um, but, uh, but, but I'm glad that, that he, he, he sort of cast a protest vote and, and left them all out. Um, good for him. That's the right thing to do, Bill Evans. I applaud you, sir. Jason, that one was, was really good. I, I had missed that story, so thank you for relaying it. Um, my parting shot is that I am uh, headed to the Nuggets game tonight to see Mason Plumley uh, and the rest of the Nuggets take on my original hometown uh, Washington Wizards, which I'm sure will be an enjoyable basketball experience. So um, that's going to be that's going to be good. I'm not sure what time we'll uh, get this episode up, so maybe the game will have already happened. But uh, I am uh, I'm excited to see Mason Plumley play. And my parting shot, uh, it was actually two. Uh, one was partly uh, something similar to Sam. Uh, the, my Pistons were in town uh, last Friday night to uh, take on uh, Sam's Washington Wizards. Uh, the Wizards ended up winning by four. It was a really good game. Uh, but what I will highlight is that Luke Kennard made his season debut uh, for the Detroit Pistons and made his first five shots and was looking really, really good uh, uh, on the court. So uh, this bodes well for me. Uh, I think Duke fans will obviously take – uh, great pride in knowing that he's off to a great start for for the Pistons and in the NBA. So uh, hopefully that continues the rest of the season. But my other parting shot that I wanted to give out quickly was a a farewell to RFK Stadium, which is uh, a, a stadium that, as many of you know, is near and dear to my heart. I know Sam uh, for the for his uh, Redskins. Uh, RFK was their home uh, for a couple decades. Uh, but uh, I think it was the last night was the last game at RFK uh, for DC United. Um, it doesn't appear there will be very many games after this uh, of any kind uh, at RFK Stadium. But if you guys had not have checked out RFK, you know that it is a cathedral uh, for for not just soccer but also football as well. Uh, and it will be sorely missed. It was a great, great atmosphere. A wonderful day yesterday, um, and that's why we're kind of recording on Monday. The the guys, thank you for letting me. Uh, enjoy that last bit of uh, of, of RFK uh, nostalgia. But uh, RFK, we salute you uh, and farewell, sir. You will be missed. Hey, uh, they the Washington Nationals also played for three for two seasons, three seasons at RFK. Correct. Um, when Before they, they opened when they the came to Washington game. in two thousand five. So I saw some man. I saw some bad baseball games there. Um, <laughs> As uh, did I actually. May, uh, yeah. Very, yeah. May it uh, may may it rest in peace. Yeah. <laughs> And that shall do it for episode 89 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. Uh, remember, you can check us out on the forums at DukeBasketballReport.com. But for Jason and for Sam, I am Donald. Thank you so much for joining us. And Duke Band, take us home.